Um, I'm pleased to be here with you this afternoon. Just a, a little history or background on me before I get started. Um, I've been working um, in manure and working with producers to help them improve um, their water quality management and environmental management out here in California um, for a little over 20 years. Um, specifically in California, California adopted um, a general order for water quality protection back in May of 2007. Um, and along with Dr. Deanne Meyer, we went out um, and um, carried out probably the single largest dairy education um, program for producers to assist them in uh, understanding what those regulations were all about um, and compliance. And we still out here um, are um, working under those same regulations, although they have tightened a bit for um, still today. So today I'm going to um, go over a project with you um, that we call the Manure Market Analysis Project. And this is a project that we commissioned um, at CDRF or the California Dairy Research Foundation on behalf um, of California's dairy industry. Um, what do we do and why do we do it and kind of who did it? So California um, is home to a little over 1.7 million dairy cows plus support stock. So, um, and most of those cows are housed on dairies. 25% of them are on dairies that are less than a thousand cows. Um, the rest of them are housed on um, dairies that are larger than that. So we produce a significant amount of manure. Um, and given our tightening water quality regulations, um, it's becoming apparent to the industry that large amounts may need to be moved off of individual farms um, to meet these requirements. Now, the good news is that California is also home to a substantial amount of, of cropland. We've got about 25 or 24 million um, acres of farmland um, and then some additional grazing land. Um, and there's about 400 different crops that are grown here in California. So um, we do have, if we can get our, our manure into a form that people want it in, uh, there's substantial area for that manure to be utilized within California. So um, we really set out to do a full-fledged um, market analysis for manure, kind of get in the heads and the minds of people that were either selling manure, managing manure, and the like, um, to identify how we could kind of enhance the value um, and identify maybe some technical solutions and strategies for meeting this market. Um, so to do this project, we um, contracted with a research team, and you may have known some of these um, various, you may have heard of some of these um, various groups, and that's Food Mind, Kinetic, Nutrient, and Cogent. So all of them brought um, very unique perspectives and um, expertise to the project. So um, what did the project team do? Well, <laughs> they did a lot of talking, if you will, um, a lot of surveys um, and a lot of interviews to really go up and down the marketplace um, and interview folks. So folks like fertilizer manufacturers, blenders, um, crop dealers and uh, retailers, as well as consultants. Um, and then they also did some deep dive interviews with uh, California growers. And again, I said we had over 400 crops. So um, many of those crops have large amounts of acres like almonds and grapes and so forth. And so they went out and actually talked to these growers and did some in-depth um, interviews with them to understand what their current uses were and um, what maybe some of the limitations were with, with using dairy products um, in the marketplace. In addition to that, um, they also interviewed dairy producers so they could understand the products, at least the raw ingredients that they were dealing with and um, you know, how dairy producers at this point were maybe supplying that to people, um, members of this uh, cropping community. They also identified regulations. It is California, so there's no lack um, for regulations uh, here in the state. And so they looked at um, any and all regulations that would be impacting um, any kind of fertilizer product or manure product um, that would be uh, potential in the marketplace. Um, and last but not least, they evaluated some potential advanced treatment technologies 
um, nutrient has with it a very large repertoire, as you're probably a, um, aware of, where they've gone and taken a look at um, advanced treatment technologies that um, people have utilized across the country. And knowing what they knew about California's um, manure, we manage a lot of it um, in a liquid system. And most of our dairies um, are flushed. So um, they took a look at, you know, which of those advanced treatment technologies may be able to be employed out here in California to get our manure into a form um, where we could then, um, you know, sell it into the marketplace. And last but not least, um, once they had done that, they surveyed California growers and kind of acquired um, some reactions to what potential products were and what the potential market size might be. So rather than talking in generalities, um, they actually put together, um, as we'll see here in a minute, um, a product line, if you will, and put that in front of them to assess what their reactions to it were. Um, and what did they find? So um, what they really found is something that we probably all um, <laughs> would anticipate, and that is we already have um, kind of this informal peer-to-peer -peer market for dairy manure um, in California. People are using manure products um, and compost products. Um, in 2017, there was actually about 640,000 acres um, in the state that already received some type of dairy manure or manure product. Um, but they also found that in talking to folks, there really is kind of this increasing opportunity for a significant expansion in the marketplace. Um, that being said, there are several barriers that were identified by would-be end users of the product. So things like, um, you know, relative low NP and K value when you compare it to other, you know, commercially available products. Um, some state and even company-specific restrictions. Um, to manure use, mostly due to um, issues with potential pathogen outbreaks. So some restriction in the timing throughout the growing season that things may be applied um, or maybe restrictions altogether. Um, there was also some other issues out there with, you know, customer perceptions um, and even some food safety requirements that were actually on the books that may prohibit certain sectors of the market from being able to utilize manure um, or certainly manure during certain times of the year, say um, when we're getting close to harvest and some of the like, depending on, um, depending on the crop that was being grown. And then last but not least, um, availability and affordability of products. Um, people were finding difficulty if they wanted to get a hold of compost, it wasn't always available. Um, and then looking at just the affordability of some of those products, again, comparing them to others that were available out in the marketplace. Um, there are multiple trends that are creating a growing market um, potential, and those include um, this real regulatory and non-regulatory pressure on the synthetic fertilizer um, industry. So there is pressure out there for people to reduce their use of synthetic fertilizers. There's also um, a growing awareness of the need to improve soil health. People are becoming more well aware um, that soil health is a is a big plays a big role in their ability to produce crops, um, and that they need to take care of the soil and um, take some steps to improve soil health. Um, expansion and expected growth in the organic market. So. We've got um, probably about a million acres, right around a million acres um, of organic um, production in the state, and they're predicting that that's going to continue to grow. And we also are seeing an, an increase in um, what we kind of call the sustainability seekers. So they might not be certified organic, um, but they are looking to use some of these quote unquote kind of softer fertilizers, if you will, um, and seeking more of a sustainable program. Um, within their system. There's also some challenges out there with applying other forms of both animal um, manures as well as human waste on ag lands. So all of this is kind of painting a picture for us that if we can produce some um, products that there is a growing market out there um, that's willing and potentially able to accept them. Um, and people are starting to recognize that manure really does have a significant agronomic um, value. So 
um, people are understanding, uh, are starting to understand or are being a, uh, more cognizant, I guess I would say, um, of manure's ability to, in, you know, improve things like soil tilt and um, just basic soil characteristics. So um, the upshot was that, you know, we could really export additional manure through this market if we could create sort of a more systematic kind of customer driven, driven um, production and distribution um, within the state. So what are end users looking for? Um, as we took a look at them, they're really, um, they, what kind of bubbled to the top is they're really looking for um, a certified, a real consistent quality that they can count on um, with the product. Obviously, they want something that's weed free. Um, they want something that's pathogen free. That came up um, very, very top, excuse me, <coughs> very high um, in many of the interviews um, that because many of our crops are going for human consumption, there was a um, there's pathogen free is um, it's a big need out there. Um, we also need something that's you know easy to transport, easy to apply specifically, um, you know something in a prill um, form or even a pelleted form. Those were highly desirable products. Um, and last but not least, again, it needs to be sort of affordable or at least comparable, if you will, um, against um, against other products that are in the marketplace. So the products that kind of bubbled to the top um, that would be relevant to the market were compost um, and products that are produced out of the DAF um, and evaporative technologies. If you're not familiar with those, um, DAF stands for dissolved air flotation. Um, and that technology produces a product that is um, essentially a dewatered solid product at about 20 to 25% dry matter and a tea water product. Um, and then the, uh, the thermal evaporative processing or TEP technology produces a product that is actually a 90% dry matter product um, as well as an aqueous ammonia. So they felt like these would be um, appropriate to utilize here in California, a method to essentially remove um, some of these solids from our liquid streams and help concentrate nutrients into a form that they could be pelletized um, or created into a prill and, um, you know, hit those desirables within, within the market. So I spoke about um, the, the uh, sort of the system, if you will, or this offerings um, of manure and manure products. And what they called it was the, the dairy manure nutrient system. So within it, it included a standard compost product that you can see here with an NP and K value and the dry matter value, as well as two what they called um, enhanced or high nutrient um, manure type products, um, which were obviously higher in NP and K as well as higher in dry, in dry matter. Um, along with a, a, this aqueous ammonia um, product for those. And then they, they created a description for what those sort of look like. Were they able to be certified organic? Were they able to be, um, was it a certified pathogen free? Um, could they get it in a pelletized form? And was it sort of burnt ready? And so this is what they put out in front of the would-be users to assess, um, to gain some assessment as to is this, um, if these products were available in the marketplace, would you use them? Um, the response and um, reactions that they received from these folks were overwhelmingly um, positive. I'm not gonna go through um, each and every number on this slide there, but you can see that um, overall impression of the products was very good. Um, do people need them on their farm? That it came out fairly high, as well as the likelihood to use um, and even at, you know, when they started including specific price points, um, the feedback was still pretty good. Um, the upshot of the entire um, thing was that 89% of respondents indicated that they would use at least one of the products from the product line, um, and 42% of them, percent of them responded that they would use more than one of the products within the line. So the industry was very um, encouraged by this feedback, 
um, and felt like, you know, this is something that they could invest money in and, and more time and effort as a way to move more manure off, um, off of dairies. So in terms of, of next steps and where the industry is at now um, is, again, I mentioned that, you know, we have this liquid stream for a high volume or high percent of our manure. We also have some solid streams. So really the goal is, um, right now is to go through and um, accurately characterize the composition of those manure streams and specifically assess them for their ability to um, apply some um, kind of medium step, mid step, if you will, technology like centrification, um, clarification, some of those other technologies to see if we can get them down to somewhere around a five to six percent total solids level um, where some of these advanced manure technologies are, are have been found to be more effective. And then um, last but not least, you know, we've, we've got to do some pilot tests, um, kind of be able to kick the tires on some of these technologies, if you will. Um, you know, are they cost effective? Do they have other operational impacts or fit in with our um, current systems? And um, last but not least, you know, can we get a consistent product quality um, out of them? Because obviously that was one thing that raised pretty highly among our end users um, for desirability.